and welcome to the weekly defense podcast, the show about defense procurement and military technology. I'm your host, Noemi Di Stefano, and also with me today are Trevor Nash, military training editor. Hi, Trevor. Hello, Noemi. And Tim Fish at the Land Desk from New Zealand. Hi, Tim. Good evening. Hi, guys. So this is a land and uh, training focused episode. Um, so I just before we start, I wanted to ask you if you wanted to tell our listeners about your weekly coverage. So Trevor, let's start from you. What did you work on this week? Well, I, I've sort of worked on two stories this week, one of which is um, the UK company aircraft manufacturer, Aralis. Um, it's added two new players to its uh, integrated design team, and, and those players are Atkins and Siemens. Um, the company itself, Aralis, is developing a new trainer aircraft, which it is expected to fly in 2024. So by adding those two team members, there has been more traction given to the programme. So we look forward to 2024 when the aeroplane actually flies. Um, another sort of uh, development has been the UK company, again, Inspire, uh, they're attending DSCI and they're launching three new simulators at the show. One which covers JTAC training, another looking at ISR uh, remotely piloted uh, aircraft systems, and also a helicopter trainer. So that, that that's probably going to cause quite a stir at the show. And one which I didn't work on, which was taken on by our news team, but it's quite an important story, and that's the fact that Saab training systems have been awarded the Combat Training Center contract in Poland. Uh, that that program has been dragging on for two and a half three years but Saab now have eventually won that and so that's a ma- major win for them. Okay thank you Trevor and as you mentioned some DSCI coverage I'll just uh, want to tell our listeners that uh, our uh, dedicated microsite is actually live now and uh, we will uh, uh, cover the show next week from the floor uh, of the Excel Center in London and Tim, what about you? What uh, what about some of the stories you you would like to highlight from uh, from this week? Uh, the main story this week is um, a follow up on a feature I did about US uh, long range precision fires. Um, there are a couple of programs that I wasn't able to get uh, up to date information on for that feature because it, it went to press. Um, but the the program offices got back to me talking about the latest updates on the long range hypersonic weapon program uh, which the US Army is running in in tandem with the US Navy and also uh, the mid-range capability which is uh, using the Navy's SM6 and uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles. So these two programs fit into uh, a sort of a batch of programs that are designed to give the US Army much much longer range uh, offensive capability to kind of meet the capabilities that are needed for a future great power competition, conflict, high-intensity warfare. Uh, the Russians and, and to some extent the Chinese far outrange and outgun the the West, NATO in general, with long-range weapons. So this will go a long way to uh, bringing the US and NATO up, up, to, up to speed in this particular department. So it's pretty important. And the fact that the US is pushing these programs, uh, particularly these two, quite fast um, through, the, through the procurement process to get them introduced within the next couple of years is, is quite impressive. And is there um, a time frame for delivery of uh, any of the capabilities under this programme? Uh, there are tests going on at the moment, uh, prototypes being delivered, and they want to start fielding in 2023. So that's uh, and a pretty pretty aggressive instruction, introductory schedule. They're doing it under those other transactional authority type agreements where they can kind of rapidly prototype uh, new technologies and get them into service much faster. Okay, thank you guys for uh, for these stories. So just before we move on, I just wanted to uh, mention other two stories. One um, from uh, Scandinavia, written by uh, Flavia Camargus Pereira. Uh, she mentions that the Swedish Defense Material Administration confirmed that the country should start negotiations this fall to validate an agreement at a government level which will see um, Sweden joining the Common Armoured Vehicle System, also known as a CAVS programme. And under this effort, Sweden, which aims to grow its ground forces from two to four brigades by 2030, should be able to provide more Padre 6x6 vehicles to its army. And um, she also notes that um, under this uh, programme, there are already two countries, Finland and Latvia, uh, and also Estonia, which is dropping in and out of the picture as well. 
And the other story I wanted to mention is a naval one, which uh, takes us to the Far East, where a South Korean news agency called Yonap reported on the 7th of September that a Korean submarine fired a ballistic missile for the first time. The launch was just an underwater ejection test. And at this stage, it is unknown whether the latest underwater ejection completed a full launch cycle and missile missile flight. And this is a story from Gordon Arthur, which concludes our headlines. And it also reminds me to inform you that later in this show, we will hear from Gordon about the news of the last 30 days in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, this week, we also have a bonus segment on the show, an interview with Tian Sensors, a European company which um, specializes in development and manufacture of electro-optic night vision systems to look at the night vision market. Now let's discuss some stories in detail. Trevor, let's start from you and one of your recent stories about the U.S. Army uh, training soldiers to counter UAS threats, and it's about a recent exercise. So tell us more about it. Um, it, It's not really UAS per se, Naomi. And I differentiate here between the use of the word drone, and by that I mean a low-cost system which could be bought from places like Radio Shack or in the U.K. Curry's and modified and used as a weapon system compared to um, remotely piloted air air systems or um, unmanned air systems which are manufactured. So we're talking about the lower end of the spectrum, we're talking about drones. Um, So the the exercise was held um, in the United States at Fort McCoy um, in June, and it involved 6,000 troops. Now, before the exercise, a number of these troops were trained on a new program which um, the 86th Training Division has implemented there, which looks at the use of these these drones um, from either governmental forces or non-state actors to disrupt the battlefield. The exercise went on. They they employed four drone pilots using these various devices, and they were used throughout the exercise and for for various things, including um, dropping propaganda leaflets, dropping simulated bombs, crashing into vehicles for the first time that the Americans had been looking at this in an exercise format. The US is very good at defining a threat and then investing to see how that threat could be countered. And the history of the low-cost drone and how to counter it in the US has gone gone back a long time and various programs, various funding streams have come through agencies such as DARPA and TRADOC. And so now with this exercise, we're we're beginning to see um, a, a, a response to the, the, these sort of threats. And uh, so I understand it was a high level um, fidelity live exercise. And uh, I, I was just wondering if, to your knowledge, this training was based on lessons learned by actual strikes that took place in recent years that, you, that the US experienced. It, it's quite interesting. Um, the the Lieutenant Colonel was in charge of this exercise, a chap called Lieutenant Colonel Patterson from the 86th Training Division. Uh, it's quoted to say at the end of the exercise, what was ironic is during our June exercise, there were nine separate drone attacks in Iraq. So as we were just launching our programme, trying to educate soldiers, there were nine kamikaze drones, as he refers to them, kamikaze drones crashing into um, vehicles or, or groups of soldiers. And, of course, if we look back over recent history, there has been considerable use of these low-cost drones. Um, in, in Syria, in Iraq, in the Syria case, Daesh has been using homemade uh, drones to target Russian forces in Syria. And that really demonstrates that these crude, easily produced systems have an impact on more sophisticated enemy forces. Again, you know, in the UK, there was a case... A couple of years ago, where a drone closed down Gatwick Airport, an expected drone because none was actually ever found or seen, but that basically closed down an international airport. So for a very minimal investment, one can achieve a massive response, a a massive result. Yeah, it's good that you mentioned the episodes that happened in the UK in 2018 and in 2019 uh, at Ethro and Gatwick airports. And I remember not long ago, I spoke to to someone and they said uh, 
when it comes to the UK, if this happened again today, I'm not sure the, U- the UK will be ready to cope with them. Um, so that, that was like a really interesting quote there. But let's go back to the US. Tim, I know we were discussing offline about this story and I know that you have some questions for Trevor. So Yeah, um, what I thought was interesting about the story was um, you quote uh, Lieutenant Colonel Patterson as saying that the average soldier is just not dialed into this type of threat. And it kind of raises a question, kind of why not? Because in the story itself, you've got a link to a previous article from 2018 that sort of highlights the the problem faced with, with these kind of drones and the threat that they pose. And it seems that the training has only just started now. Um, is, it, is it just the case that it takes time to put it, to analyse the threat and to, to come up with the concepts and to then put a programme like this in, in motion? Or do you think they've just been a bit slow on the take up? Because as, as you've mentioned, these things have been around for some time and causing a lot of havoc um, in, in all kinds of theatres. You know, Tim, I think we can draw a parallel here with um, the IED in Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, IEDs have been around for a long time and it took the military a heck of a long time to find investment and counters to, to that particular weapon system. And I think it's the same to a certain extent with these low-cost drones. As I mentioned, you know, the US has been talking about it for some years through DARPA and TRADOC, but we're only now seeing courses like the 86 uh, Training Division launched and this exercise, which is actually addressing the issue. I think it shines a spotlight on the new, you know, the face of battle that... In the past, it was all main battle tanks, self-propelled artillery, air defence systems. We're now moving to more of an AI-driven cyberspace, intelligence sort of network-based system with, with the use of unmanned systems. And I think it's taking the military a long time to catch up with this new type of warfare. Yeah, I mean, with the drawing the parallel with the IEDs is quite interesting because IEDs uh, brought logistics and, you know, backup and supply forces into the front line the front line was as you mentioned previous sort of previously battle tanks and armored vehicles all equipped for front line operations and all of a sudden you know with insurgency and ieds you have support vehicles and equipment being and convoys being attacked just as much or if not, if not more frequently than the front line units were themselves and if you've got these small drones that can be you know produced on mass and unlike a, a larger military built drone are not as easily detectable and can function as swarms or just turn up in, in kind of locations you don't expect them to. I mean, I was quite taken by the story when you said that, you know, these these can turn up anywhere at any time, whether you're in your tent doing guard duty in a, in a convoy, which are all behind enemy lines. So that raises the prospect of having to be pretty switched on when you come away from the front line or wherever the fighting is taking place and you go and relax. You can't actually relax anymore because these things could turn up. So I guess my next question is is really about uh, what was there any indication about the type, were they allowed to talk about the type of training that they were doing in response to these? Is it just a case of learning to to look and observe and to be alert to, to that kind of threat? Or are they actually practicing proper response drills if one of these things or a swarm of these things are actually spotted um, and and how to how to react to that that particular threat as it comes in? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because um, th- th- they didn't talk too much about how they would respond to it. But given the proliferation um, and what's been covered in the past, we do know there are two methods of dealing with these things. You know, one's a hard kill, one's a soft kill. So the hard kill is um, well, well, it varies from in. Holland in the Netherlands, they train birds on airfields to attack the drone. So from your, you know, your, your, your bird to weapons to nets, that's the hard kill, bringing the thing down. And of course, the soft kill is disrupting the um, RF link to the to the drone itself. Um, I, I just think it's incredibly difficult to counter them because... Even with soft kill and hard kill, you need to have that equipment in place to address the threat that you you are currently facing. Um, and there was one classic case in this um, exercise where a convoy of Humvees was going down a road and they put mines on the road, on the surface of the road. So the convoy stopped. And as the convoy stopped, 
a drone popped up in front of the convoy and everybody was so keen and focused on this drone, trying to shoot it down with their small arms, that they didn't actually notice the fact that somebody had snuck up on the convoy and thrown a chemical weapon into one of the trucks and then retreated. And the, you know, the, the, the chemical weapon, simulated chemical weapon detonated. So it, it, it's an interesting area. I think we are well behind the curve in, in terms of countering these things. And a lot more investment needs to be done. But uh, Trevor, do you think that um, uh, there will be other exercises like this? Do you know anything about it? Is this exercise a part of a wider program? Are they going to be further investments in this? Yeah, it is part of a wider program. They've introduced these courses at um, uh, Fort McCoy now, where you know people go in there and they talk about the drone threat, how you know the threat that that those low cost drones um, present, and also how to counter them. And um, one of the things, uh, the Royal United Services Institute in the UK was looking at ways to counter these drones. And one of the things that they were talking about was bringing back rapid fire cannons, such as, you know, the, the old Russian ZSU-23-4, the Shilka. Um, whether we go down that route, I don't know. Um, but they were also talking about um, the fact that the proliferation is so high now It, that they are just going to be commonplace on the battlefield or indeed in security situations. So we really do need to define how we're going to uh, look, look at this threat in the future. I just wanted to ask you about the UK. I know you highlighted the difference between small drones and UAS, but uh, uh, really I... I I was looking at the integrated review when it came out early uh, in spring and I was talking to people and everyone agrees that in this in integrated review, there is no mention uh, of a country UAS strategy, of a country drone strategy. Do you think the UK should look at this type of training? Well, it surely should, but do you think it will look at this type of training to counter this threat? Do you think the UK is aware it recognizes this threat as a growing one? I think the UK certainly recognises the threat. How much it's going to invest in trying to counter the threat is a different question, really. If you look at the UK's air defence forces, um, that they've literally been decimated over the last decade. The, our air defence capability in the UK now is, is incredibly poor. And that's also the case to an extent in the United States. And I think one of the issues that has led to that situation is because... The West has been very successful in Iraq, um, where there were very few aeroplanes lost to enemy fire. And so, therefore, maybe the concept of air defence required anymore, given our great ability at suppression of enemy air defences, CAD, um, means that we think that we don't need air defence. I think it's it's a fallacy. Not, a, not only for low-cost drones, but in future conflicts, peer-on-peer peer peer conflicts, we, we need air defence. Just on a closing note then, would you expect the UK then to adopt the same approach as the US and start training the army against these threats in the near future? Yeah, yes, I would. Yes, I would. And there's no reason why they can't integrate that sort of training relatively easily because we've got to, you know, we use um, live training at the moment quite significantly Uh, places like Batas, although that has been reduced by the removal of the Challenger main battle tanks. Uh, we use training in, in Kenya, massive training area, and of course our own training areas in the UK, such as Salisbury Plain training area. So we've got lots of uh, live training areas. It will be super to see more counter drone and counter UAS training get, taking place. Okay, thank you, Trevor. Let's move from training to land. Tim, you wrote a story this week about Germany investing in a new system demonstrator. So tell us about it. Um, what is happening? Yeah, there was a uh, announcement back in June about a new systems demonstrator. Uh, I won't pronounce the German name, uh, but its shorthand is, is Lua. Um, that is uh, designed to replace the German army's weasel vehicle, which is kind of a light Uh, not really a light tank, it's a kind of a weapons carrying vehicle, so it's, it's, uh, it, can, it can transport a variety of different weapons. But this is a uh, quite a radically designed uh, systems demonstrator because it's got four separate track vehicles. If you look at the picture, um, it, it shows quite something quite uh, new and probably able to provide quite a lot of new capabilities. 
when I when I saw it, I thought I'd, I'd chase up the Bundeswehr and find out some more information about it. So what was unveiled in, in June was a static demonstrator. So there's actually going to be a functional presentation of, uh, of, of a demonstrator taking place uh, middle of next month. Yeah, it's it's a very weird uh, design. I I looked at the picture and I, I thought it was really weird, but I think that um, this design would allow probably for uh, easier loading into a transport aircraft, I suppose, with this configuration. Um, I just wanted to ask you, so uh, the background to this program is that um, it's going to replace the older platforms, the Visa ones, but um, you mentioned in your story that uh, the new vehicles are not going to be delivered probably in before the next decade. So what will happen meanwhile? In the meantime, uh, if the... If the the GSD Lua gets approved after 2022, they'll produce it and they'll start delivering it over the next decade. But uh, as you mentioned, the the existing uh, weasel vehicle will, will be getting quite old. It was first introduced in 1985. So there is currently a upgrade program being taking, taking place to upgrade about just over half of them to, to stay in service for the next decade to cover that gap. Um, Trevor, I see you want to ask a question. Yeah, Tim, do you see this as a general trend in Western militaries to move away from what I'd call the old school main battle tanks, artillery, as I was mentioning before, to a new form of lighter vehicles, lighter track vehicles and wheeled vehicles in general? There probably should be a trend in that direction, but I don't think, I haven't seen anything that suggests that there is a real move amongst a whole load of, of armies, Western armies, to, to go in that direction. The, the Weasel and, and now the Louvre are designed to, for, for airborne forces to go into forward areas with them to give them protection from aircraft and for enemy tanks that, that potentially could come and, and defeat them because airborne soldiers are not able to carry heavy weapons with them to defeat heavy armour or, or aircraft. So with, with the Weasel and with, the, with this um, new vehicle, they, they should be able to carry anti-tank weapons and 27mm uh, potentially automatic cannons, the kinds that you get on, on aircraft themselves to provide uh, air defence. So th this is not for uh, land manoeuvres. This is not going to run with uh, uh, main battle tanks and armoured fighting vehicles. This is not a part of kind of your main armoured division, your armoured manoeuvre brigades or anything like that. This is kind of separate to that. And I haven't really seen it in the same way at all. Okay, and I just wanted to ask you on the investment side. I mean, it looks like a very sharp, polished uh, design and it looks quite expensive. Do we know anything about how much this will cost who is funding the development of this project as well? It's still a research and technology program. They didn't, uh, the Bundeswehr didn't give any details about the funding, uh, probably because they don't really know themselves yet. I think once they've done the evaluation, they will come up with a, a final kind of uh, analysis and a, and a customer product management system, which which they'll make a decision about in towards the end of next year, and that will be the basis from which they then uh, continue the development and procurement of, of, of an actual system beyond in that sort of time frame. So, funding levels and actual procurement numbers uh, in terms of price will will probably be decided later on that point to see if it's feasible. If they want to replace the weasel, then they're going to have to make a decision on that relatively quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we, we're running out of time. Is there anything else you would like to add, Tim, Trevor? Um, no, not really. I, I, I'm just fascinated, you know, and I keep harping back to the uh, UK's integrated review where and I'm going to give you another quote now about Ben Wallace. He, he said, in defence, it's always tempting to use the shield of sentimentality to protect battle-winning but now outdated capabilities. And I'm just very interested at the moment in a general defence sense about where we're going in the future. Um, with, with the MBT, main battle tank, whether that's going to be tracked or we're, whether we're going to have wheeled variants... We're going through a very interesting phase as, we, as we're looking at, uh, you know, putting more emphasis on AI and cyberspace and networks, as I said before, and space. So I think we're in a very, very interesting position at the moment. 
Are you going to try? Well, you're going to try. Are you, do you think you will find answers to your questions next week at DSCI, maybe? <laughs> I, I look forward, forward to asking those questions to people at DSCI. I think it's going to be a good show. Thank you, Trevor, and thank you for your quotes. Um, I know you have an extensive list, so you are disclosing them in, it, in every episode that you are, uh, that you are uh, participating to. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Tim, as well. I just wanted to inform our listeners that this would be uh, the last episode that Tim Fish will be uh, with us, um, I mean, on a regular basis on the weekly news roundup, because um, Flavia Camargo Pereira will be back in a couple of weeks with us. Um, but you will hear from Tim in other episodes of the podcast, I'm sure, pretty soon. So thank you, Tim, for your contribution so far and for your expertise on the podcast. Oh, no worries. Uh, it's been an enjoyable experience. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, I will see you next week at DSCI. We will be live. Well, we won't be live. We will be recording from um, the floor of DSCI next week. And uh, meanwhile, if you want to find out more about the copies we discussed today, previous episode of the podcast, video content and more, you can visit our website shepherdmedia.com forward slash news. That's all from me uh, as well this week. We'll be back after the break, this time with Ben Vogel in conversation with Gordon Arthur. Artificial intelligence is rapidly changing the world in which we live. Evidence of artificial intelligence is all around us and will have profound implications on everyday life in the decades to come. In the military world, artificial intelligence technologies are having a similarly massive effect and are beginning to change the face of modern warfare. Artificial intelligence and machine learning applications promise to enhance productivity, reduce user workload, and operate more quickly than humans. But this doesn't come without its challenges. How easy is it for an adversary to fool artificial intelligence systems? How well do AI systems cope with a chaotic and ever-changing conflict? And how will the human in the loop oversee AI systems on a battlefield swarming with autonomous assets? The Artificial Intelligence on the Battlefield podcast dives into these issues and more. How will artificial intelligence reshape the future of warfare? Created by Shepard Studio, in partnership with our sponsor Sistel, the Artificial Intelligence on the Battlefield podcast on shepherdmedia.com forward slash news or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to our regular segment with Shepherd's Asia-Pacific expert, Gordon Arthur, as we cast an eye over some of the most important recent stories from the region. Hi, Gordon. How are you? Good day, Ben. In the depths of winter down in New Zealand, but you're out of lockdown, right? Uh, in fact, we've, we've entered spring and um, at least my part of New Zealand where we're loosening up the, the lockdown. So that's good. Must be a relief. <laughs> so um, let's start the, the roundup in India, where the Indian Navy is once again relaunching efforts for LPDs and mine countermeasures vessels. Um, perhaps uh, you can start by outlining what the concept of operations is for these new LPDs. Right. So on the 24th of August, uh, the Indian Navy issued a a request for information regarding these LPDs, um, as you said. So this has been a, a long-held ambition of the Indian Navy to actually have more than the one LPD that it currently has, which is a an ex-US Navy ship. Um, so they're looking for, for four ships for amphibious purposes. Uh, we remember that India um, does have offshore islands, um, for example, the, the Nicobar and Andaman Islands. So it, it would like a, a ship able to carry amphibious equipment. Of course, it would also be very suitable for um, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief type missions as well. But certainly it, it wants to give a big boost to its amphibious warfare capabilities. Okay. And uh, what kind of make in India capabilities are there for this kind of vessel? Yeah, I mean, uh, just about everything. Everything that India tries to do is, is under the, the make in India um, badge as far as it can. This is actually the, the second time that India's sought um, LPDs. So a first effort was in 2013 when it was looking for four ships. Uh, that all turned to custard, as many Indian procurements do. 
And so this is basically a, a relaunch um, of, of that earlier effort eight years ago. Um, I mean, basically all that time has passed and nothing has been achieved. So this time they're looking to, to build the ships in India, but uh, Indian shipbuilders can tie up with a, a foreign OEM um, and they'd be looking for transfer of technology, technical assistance and so on for um, the building of these ships uh, within India. So they actually have a, a very, um, I would describe it as a very um, stiff list of requirements, a very high level. I mean, you just look at the the armaments that it's, it's talking about. 32 vertically launched short-range surface-to-air missiles, 16 anti-ship missiles, four close-in weapon systems, machine guns, a directed energy weapon, uh, medium machine guns, and long-range acoustic devices and chaff launchers. So that's that's pretty incredible for an amphibious warfare ship. That's right, yeah. It seems like almost a, a, a destroyer or frigate level of armament. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, there's probably only four Indian shipyards that would be capable of building this, um, and each of them will, will probably be looking to, to tie up uh, with a foreign OEM. Now, I think we would expect the design is going to be based on something foreign um, and then maybe customised to, to Indian requirements. So perhaps the, the French, the Spanish, the Italians, South Koreans would be the, the main contenders, I would say. Great. And um, in terms of the, the mine countermeasure vessels um, that uh, the Indian Navy is also buying, I mean, are these going to be new build or, or second-hand ships? A little bit like the, the LPD issue. Um, India was going to buy mine countermeasure vessels from South Korea um, a number of years ago. And, and again, that just all crumbled into nothingness. Um, it all fell through. So this is, a, this is an urgent requirement now because uh, the Indian Navy has retired every single one of its um, MCMVs. So it's, it hasn't got a single one in service. So they're getting desperate. And the RFI issued in August, um, it's looking for three to four of these vessels um, from a foreign uh, country, and they can be procured directly or leased. Now, if because it wants them urgently, obviously they're not going to be new build, so they'll be looking to buy secondhand uh, vessels from, from a foreign navy. And I'm, I'm afraid the Indian Navy has or the MO, Indian MOD has sort of dug themselves in a hole here um, just simply because of um, the slowness of their procurement processes. So um, why can't India make these vessels domestically? Well, this was the interesting thing. Er- earlier on, um, they were going to buy ships from Kangnam Corporation in South Korea. They're going to get 12 um, 810, 800-ton mine countermeasure vessels. It's quite a tongue twister there, Ben. Yeah, it's a tongue twister, all right, you're right. <laughs> uh, and they, they were going to be pursued under the Make in India initiative. Goa Shipyard Limited was going to be the, the shipbuilder. Um, however, those negotiations fell through um, in 2015. Um, so it's sort of been in abeyance since then. Um, it retired its last Russian-built um, MCMV in 2019. So it, it hasn't had a mine clearance vessel for two years. So uh, an interesting naval capability gap for India. So uh, one one to keep an eye on in the foreseeable future. Mm. Um, let's turn to neighbouring Pakistan, um, where there is a new defence cooperation agreement with Turkey. Uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit more about that? Yeah, this one was an agreement was signed at the IDF exhibition uh, in mid-August. It, it didn't receive an awful lot of publicity, um, sort of just like a little side note. But I think it's an interesting um, agreement that was reached. So this is between Pakistan's National Engineering and Science Commission and Turkish Aerospace. And the agreement covers the anchor mail UAV and it it involves joint production and development of components um, for this particular UAV. Uh, The details that have been released publicly are pretty scant Um, But from the gist of it, it seems that Pakistan is seeking to basically gain um, technology um, and technical expertise, um, learning from the the Turkish, and then perhaps assembling um, or license producing 
these UAVs within Pakistan. So there are industrial benefits, in other words, for the Pakistani aerospace industry from this arrangement? Yeah, um, I think it's interesting. Uh, Turkey and Pakistan have been doing uh, quite a bit together um, in recent times. So this is just uh, sort of emblematic of this closer cooperation uh, between the two countries. Uh, we can think about the uh, the T-129 attack helicopters. Uh, Pakistan army's been has ordered those from Turkish aerospace, but of course that's all on hold uh, because of the American sanctions. Um, Turkey's also building frigates um, for uh, the Pakistan Navy. That's the uh, Jinnah class, I believe. Correct. Yeah, and, and in return too, uh, Pakistan is, is building a number of um, train, basic trainer aircraft, 52 of them, um, for the Turkish Air Force uh, and, and yet to hand over those any of those trainers so far. Um, but I think it's also interesting the approach um, that... Pakistan is taking here, um, I believe, and it's, it's a, a program shrouded in secrecy, but Pakistan has been trying to develop its own um, unmanned combat air vehicle. Um, how much progress it's been making is difficult to say because they haven't released anything publicly, but I would suspect that they're facing difficulties and cooperating with Turkey would be a good way to, um, to gain some benefits with its own program. Um, and can I also mention, Ben, um, the Pakistan's um, dependence on Chinese UAVs as well? Yes, I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, this is a, a very secretive um, thing. Pakistan doesn't say an awful lot about it. But we know that um, the Air Force and also the Army um, rely on an unknown number of uh, UAVs from China. So maybe I can just quickly run through some of the things that it has. Be my guest. Yeah. So we know that it, it has the Winglong 1 um, UCAV. And we know that because in 2016, one of them crashed uh, near a, a Pakistani airbase. So that was the first indication that Pakistan had the Winglong 1. Um, satellite imagery shows they have at least two um, in service. We're not sure how many altogether. Later, uh, Pakistan Air Force introduced the, the Wing Long 2, um, so a more enhanced um, aircraft. It's been spotted again in satellite imagery. No one has ever seen them or no one has taken photos of them on the ground. So again, we don't really know how many um, that the Air Force is operating. Then earlier this year, Shepard reported um, the CH-4B uh, UCAV um, had arrived in Pakistan. This is for the Army. The Army ordered quote, a large amount of uh, these particular uh, UCAVs. Again, how many? I don't know, uh, but it would certainly be interesting and, and it should be a, um, quite a number. At least four have been seen um, at a, an army airbase. And it's believed the Pakistan Navy um, is also interested in the, the CH-4B unmanned aircraft. So you can see they have quite a lot of Chinese-built um, stuff. Um, Pakistan is now cooperating with Turkey on a, a similar uh, capability, UCAV, and it's trying to develop um, its own uh, particular aircraft. So that's it's quite a lot going on um, in Pakistan. Um, I, I can also mention uh, there have been unverified reports that Pakistan uh, UCAVs have actually been used in Afghanistan, supporting the Taliban uh, fighting in the, the Pangaea um, Valley. I, I don't know whether that's true or not, but it has been reported. Well, uh, the Taliban certainly have a, an embarrassment of riches in terms of captured material from, from uh, the Afghan army in the US. So uh, maybe mm. maybe they're looking at, uh, at uh, Pakistani help as well. Um, certainly the Pakistanis um, have a history, a notorious history of helping uh, the Taliban in the past. Well, we certainly hope that, that none of them end up in the Taliban's hands, that's for sure. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so uh, speaking of China, as you did uh, just now, um, in relation to the uh, UAV development, um, you've also been looking into self-propelled artillery developments for the People's Liberation Army. Um, can you shed a bit more light on that story? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, China is always introducing new equipment um, into its various um, forces, um, services. And recently, there have been photos circulating um, on the Chinese internet of uh, a new type of self-propelled howitzer. So it's been called the, the PLZ 05B. Um, which obviously follows on from the PLZ-05A and the original PLZ-05. Um, and this is the, the PLA Ground Force's heaviest uh, tracked self-propelled howitzer, 155 millimeter gun. The interesting thing with this new vehicle, um, and it's only been photographed, uh, being carried on, on tractor trailers um, on Chinese roads, um, it has seven road wheels per side. Now, this is the, the largest chassis we've seen in a, a Chinese AFE. Um, even the main battle tanks only have six road wheels per side, so it, it indicates the, the hull is pretty large, um, and it's probably a very heavy um, vehicle, so better armour, better ballistic protection, uh, more space um, inside this particular vehicle. I don't know whether it's it's been introduced yet. Uh, perhaps it's on the verge um, of being fielded by the PLA. Um, I'm suspect it could be in the region of a 50 ton um, vehicle and uh, it should um, increase um, the the capability of of the Chinese artillery. Uh, one benefit of having a larger vehicle is the amount of ammunition that can be carried. Um, the old uh, PLZ-05 had 30 rounds of ammunition inside uh, the new one, I believe, can carry up to 60 rounds. Uh, we've also seen photos of ammunition resupply vehicles um, for these self-propelled houses too. So there's some appreciable differences between the old and new versions of the uh, PLZ-05. But um, I suppose uh, the country which is going to be paying most attention uh, to this as a peer adversary to China is the United States. Um, how is the US Army reacting to uh, this development of a, a modernised PLZ-05? Uh, I have no idea, Ben, because they didn't respond to my story. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, what we, it's quite interesting, uh, just about the same time as, as we um, broke this news, um, the US Army headquarters, uh, they released a very interesting document. Um, it's called Chinese Tactics. Um, and it basically, it gives a very detailed rundown of the, the equipment, the structure, the tactics, um, the limitations uh, of the PLA ground forces. And I found it a very interesting read. Um, it did talk about um, Chinese artillery. And maybe I can just read out a, one or two little snippets that I thought would be quite interesting for readers. Go ahead. So this is the U.S. Army headquarters. It said, no other capability area within the PLA has received greater emphasis during the recent period of reform than fire support. In just over two decades, PLA fire support evolved from a collection of aging Soviet-derived equipment to a largely indigenous, sophisticated, widely varied, and numerous collection of gun and rocket systems. Um, and it goes on to describe some of the, the tube artillery, the, the rocket artillery uh, equipment that the, the PLA have. And the U.S. Army assesses these systems give the group army a significant advantage in both range and firepower over equivalent Western formations. So, yeah, artillery, uh, a strong point um, in the PLA ground forces. Mm. Certainly a, a worrying conclusion that uh, you just quoted there. Um, one last thing on this story. Um, you, you also mentioned how Russian troops uh, recently gained access to PLA equipment in, in some kind of joint exercise between China and Russia. Um, this appears to be a pretty significant development, doesn't it? Yeah, so 9th to the 13th of August, um, there was a, an exercise that was called Interaction 2021. Uh, this was held uh, in the interior of China. And as you say, Russian and Chinese troops uh, worked together. And I believe this is the first time the Russians have been given such complete access um, to Russian, uh, sorry, to, to Chinese armored vehicles. Um, they were using uh, the ZBL 09, which is a, an 8x8 infantry fighting vehicle and the ZTL-11, which is a, a fire support vehicle. 
Um, so the Chinese trained up the Russian troops. They were able to use um, these vehicles um, and, and take part in the exercise. Um, so that's, yeah, China is, is, is pretty paranoid and xenophobic about um, letting anyone close to its equipment. So I thought this was a this was quite an interesting development. Um, the Chinese and Russians working so closely together. Interesting. Um, we are running out of time, Gordon. But um, before we go, I'd just like to ask you, as a New Zealander, uh, about a, a story that you looked at close to home uh, in terms of a new electronic warfare tender. Yeah. So this is just basically responding to a, a document. It was it was called a registration of interest issued by the New Zealand MOD on the 11th of August. So New Zealand Defence Force is looking for vendors uh, who would like to help New Zealand's army to improve its electronic warfare capability. And I mean, electronic warfare is, is a pretty secret squirrel type branch, and we don't really know much about EW in a lot of countries. But I think in New Zealand's case, it's probably because the, the EW capability is very small, infinitesimal um, to start off with. If you look at the size of uh, the project, um, it's only $4.2 million US. So it's, it's not a large contract, but I think it's interesting that the New Zealand Army is seeking to, to develop um, its electronic warfare capabilities. Um, it's, it's basically um, looking for um, a battle management system. Um, so this will integrate with existing L3 Harris tactical radio radios and the site aware system. And it's also looking for electronic support system, uh, a spectrum survey system, and an introductory electronic attack. I believe electronic attack is something New Zealand has never uh, possessed before. Um, so they're looking for systems that can be carried by soldiers and um, also ones that can be mounted on vehicles. So as, as we say, it's just a registration of interest. Um, they're looking for companies, probably a company that has experience with a, a Five Eyes partner nation, um, and then they'll um, take it from there. Uh, they expect a contract could be um, awarded perhaps in the middle of next year. Okay, interesting, an interesting indication of Kiwi ambitions. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Gordon, and uh, we look forward to speaking to you next time. Thanks, Ben. Great to talk to you as always. For over 40 years, Shepard has led the defence and aerospace sector with magazines, equipment handbooks, and cutting-edge news stories. Shepard now champions the best business information and marketing solutions across digital, so your business can have the decisive edge in everything you do. Make your team the competitive advantage. Partner with Shepard today. Get in touch with one of our customer experts to discuss your needs at shepherdmedia.com. Since the 1960s, Night vision technology has been a common component of military applications requiring object identification in low light and extremely dark conditions. This includes binoculars, but other applications include weapon sites, handheld and tripod mounted systems, airborne and vehicle applications, and range finding. While some types of night vision technology, such as thermal images, are more expensive than other night illumination technologies, new developments have driven the cost down. With me to discuss recent developments, market trends and potential future innovations in this sector is Christian Hajiminas, CEO of Theon Sensors and President of EFA Group in Greece. Christian, welcome to the Weekly Defence Podcast. Thank you for having me here with you. Okay, um, allow me to start, Christian, by asking you about um, some recent developments with Theon. Um, you recently won a big contract to provide binocular night vision goggles for the German and Belgian militaries, for example. What does this say about the state of the market in Europe? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a very nice question because it gives me the opportunity to First of all, we were very happy uh, during the ceremony. It was really interesting to, to see OCAR, which was the procurement authority, which is a, a group of, of, uh, of countries designed to coordinate their procurement activities. And um, of course, um, 
the fact that we were there in this ceremony, which was the, a German company, Hensold, was a Greek company, Theon Sensors, and then people from different parts of Europe. And, uh, and it made me realize that uh, we've been saying this, but a lot of things have changed in Europe the last two or three years. Um, I think uh, maybe it was the President Macron who, who stated that it's time that we have a unified European uh, defense industry. And uh, indeed, there, there's a lot of things have changed. First of all, defense is not anymore in Europe as it used to be a, a bad word. Uh, because in the States, it was always very, people who are in the defense industry were very highly respected. And in Europe, it was not so much the case. Anyway, this has changed. That's number one change. The number two change is that the procurement, uh, although there's always resistance locally in every country to, to uh, support the, their local industries, in fact, in general, there is, with the new legislation from uh, Europe, from the European Union, it has opened up a lot, and therefore there is less resistance and preference for local industries, which is that's the way it should be. It should be like in the States, uh, you have so many states, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's no preference really between one country to another. The contract must be uh, obtained from the ones who meet the criteria, technical and price-wise. So this was another big proof because we were selected, uh, we did, a, of course, a cooperation with Hensoldt, uh, but it was another proof that uh, there are people in Europe are becoming to be open-minded. Mind you, Theon Sensor, which is a Greek company, and uh, it's, you know, Greece uh, does not have many other cases of uh, export-oriented industries, but the, we were already in many countries, but this was a very big contract, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, we were selected on, on their criteria, of course, and uh, uh, they, they felt confident that uh, a, a company which is in the north, southern part of Europe can, can do the job. So that, 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 was a good, that, that was a good message, not just for us, of course, but for the whole of European defense industry. It's a very interesting point that you're making because there has been a lot of talk and a lot of movement and many positive words spoken over recent years, maybe even recent decades, about cross-border procurement. Um, are you saying that now you're finally seeing the words being turned into action? Yes, and, and Ben, I will tell you, not, not just in terms of procurement, I think for the first time, and I, I want to believe that Theon... Uh, has contributed a lot in this uh, area. Uh, uh, the European companies have started realizing that they have to get together. And allow me to say, because I've lived in, uh, in England uh, for four years in my life, uh, when I say European defense industry, I still cannot uh, exclude because uh, you know, Britain has left the EU. I, I consider Britain and you know, you, when I say European defense industry, I don't mean just European Union uh, members. What, what I think is, uh, companies have started realizing in Europe is that uh, not just from the procurement side, but because the procurement side is now a mirror of what's going to happen and is happening on the company side. You have all of a sudden uh, companies cooperating with each other. You know, you have it, for instance, in the States, you know, Boeing and Lockheed. You know, they're big competitors to each other, but they do also programs together. And this civilized way of in uh, serving efficiency above all is started working in Europe a lot now and uh, we have for instance you know we have we have great cooperation not just with Hensold we work with other European companies like Safran and um, you know we work with them in Switzerland we work with them in Brazil we work in many countries together and it, and, it, and it's really working it's not just uh, press releases and then uh, I think a lot of other companies will follow. Uh, we, we are doing our best to do this. And uh, hopefully we will, before the year end, we will also announce uh, uh, various uh, initiatives in this direction. Okay. And, and so while the European market is showing signs of evolution, if not revolution. Uh, Finally. How, 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 what kind of regional differences in market demand do you notice in, in your sector elsewhere in the world? Well, um, the, you know, it's, there's no, the regional differences is a timing difference. 
In other words, whatever, and frankly speaking right now, what, what the last 20, 30 years, whatever was going on in the US, uh, for instance, if the US, to talk about the night vision, if the US wanted to do uh, uh, emphasis on monoculars, then they would go to binoculars, then, uh, or maybe parallelly, they would try thermal, which they did. More or less, this is the story with the rest of the world. And therefore, there's the original difference is just a question of timing. So if the U.S. has bought a lot of monoculars or binoculars uh, and the other companies, the difference is that the other companies will now also buy the, the, the thing after five or ten years. So I don't really see any regional differences. And the only perhaps difference that I could say is that in some countries outside of Europe or within Europe, People will, um, because of budget constraints or because of G their GDP, they will buy less expensive. Having said that, uh, we, we, what, uh, what we are seeing is that uh, the, also the, the prices are going down. There are also, as you mentioned in, the, in your introductory remarks, uh, the thermal uh, is going down. I think SWEAR has been uh, resisting uh, this trend a little bit, but now hopefully it's going gonna, it's gonna to come full swing because at the end of the day, the end user must have a full options. And if those options can be combined and made smarter, if you want, uh, with proper artificial intelligence and, and interoperability, that would be fantastic. But again, I'm talking about the night vision still, and I think some companies miscalculated this thing uh, and left the night vision area. Still, night vision, the, the not thermal, but image intensification night vision, is really the main body and it will remain for the next three, five, six years at least. Maybe there would be some fusion here and there. Maybe there would be a little bit more thermal as now they're becoming cheaper, but... Uh, image intensification, night vision uh, is, is the main body. So um, as, as night vision equipment, it's, it's now, you know, fairly widely available, Christian, and, and it seems to be relatively cheap with a, the with a cost coming down uh, all the time. Do you think that industry needs to uh, be a bit more imaginative and think uh, more laterally in order to stay uh, in in touch with a with a broader range of potential adversaries using using the technology. I mean, uh, uh, for instance, uh, I suppose the Taliban now in in Afghanistan have been able to get hold of hold of some uh, reasonably advanced uh, U.S. made equipment. Yeah. Well, first of all, about this comment, <laughs> uh, the Taliban did not have only do not have only equipment, but they also have people who have been trained to use this equipment, and that's the problem. Anyway, uh, but to go back to your question, uh, yes, it's interesting that you say this in the civil sector, uh, you know, in computers, internet, there is so much innovation that is not uh, customer driven in the sense that like Steve Jobs, you know, Steve Jobs said, uh, the, 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 uh, really said, you know, you, you don't wait to hear from your customers what they want. You design something that they have not even thought about that. Unfortunately, this thing does not apply still in the defense area. In the defense area, all the new innovation is, is driven by the end user. The end user comes up with a tender and asks X, Y, Z additional uh, things. And then, of course, the industry follows. It's not, I have not really seen in our, in our area of night vision somebody uh, really coming up with something that has not been thought. Uh, from uh, from the end user. It's an end user driven. Actually, I will give you a very specific example for, uh, for your audience. Uh, the reason why Theon has become uh, uh, very strong in the night vision, in the image intensification especially, was because at some stage the Swedes, uh, some time ago, 15 years ago, while everybody was using the PBS 14, the US standard for this industry, um, everybody was using PBS 14 or PBS 14 lookalike, and all of a sudden the Swedes came and they asked for some crazy things. Uh, I mean, really, they tried to combine the best of the world and they added some crazy things. And you know that forced us and the others who participated. In the end, of course, we won 
to come up with something totally new. I mean, within the within the mature industry. And once we did this, then all of a sudden, when we won the contract, once we did this, they they all of a sudden we start selling this new type, the non-US monocular, everywhere around the world. So as I said, to summarize, right now, still the end user calls the shots in innovation. They decide what they want, and then the rest of us as an industry, we follow. At some stage, I'm sure somebody is going to come up with something crazy and uh, it will not be that crazy at the end of the day. Let's hope not. I can't imagine the Swedes doing anything crazy, but uh, you've just uh, described something happening there. No, no, but it, it was not really crazy. It, it was, they, 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 they said, well, we have four different monoculars and we want we want a little bit uh, the best of all, and then oh, a couple of ideas. And and you know they were right about that. They were they were right about every single thing they ask. And and we are grateful. And the industry should be grateful to you and users like that that come up with uh, those quote unquote crazy things. It's interesting how yes, uh, much as industry innovates on its own account, there are as you say requirements from the end users that encourage industry to do that innovation. Um, you, you mentioned a, a bit earlier, Christian, about how image intensification uh, systems are, well, they remain extremely important within the broader night vision sector. But do you see that balance changing a little bit? You also mentioned a bit earlier SWIR, which uh, for any listeners who don't know what that means is a shortwave infrared. Um, are those growing in importance or remaining pretty much the same? No, uh, just like the thermal, they they will come into full swing also square at some stage. It will not be a quick process. And that's why I'm saying for the next five years, uh, image intensification business will remain important. But I think the, the, the big changes there are, are coming and they are obvious already. It's not from whether it's going to be instead of II or instead of thermal sphere and everything, because a lot of those uh, uh, technologies have advantages. The progress, the, the, the change will come from fusing them. Already in the States, they, they started they, they doing this on a bigger industrial scale to fuse thermal and, and I, I square technology. You also mentioned uh, artificial Intelligence is another. Yes, drive. exactly. That's what I, I was driving to. Now, now the the idea would be to make a, a sensor, which is the II or monocular binocular. In essence, that's what it is. To make it smarter, and 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 already this is happening. Uh, this is happening by connecting it to other uh, equipment and collecting information from different angles. Uh, then it will be a connection uh, with uh, with drones, uh, you know, because it's a little bit, a drone is, is near a soldier, it's not that up in the stratosphere, like a, an aircraft, and and there will be those connections. This, these are, the, this will be the next uh, phases, connect, connectivity and making them therefore smarter, uh, smarter uh, equipment. So, in other words, what you've just described uh, with this fusion, you're looking at a future of networked night vision. Yes, exactly. Uh, which is the trend on everything that we see. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we also ma we also makers of uh, microelectromechanical sensors at different company, which is more on the civil side, and basically that's what it is. It, 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 it transforms a, uh, the observation of a physical phenomenon like vision at, in the night, transforms it into a digital signal, and then this one, you can process it with a computer, central computer or whatever. So yes, uh, and, and, and the exchange of information between the different images from two different soldiers. So yes, the, 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 this, this is the future. I see. Finally, uh, Christian, I, I've noticed that Theon has established a a new subsidiary company in the Middle East, um, to be specific in, in Saudi Arabia, in order to promote, produce and develop night vision and thermal imaging systems. So um, I've got kind of a two-part question for you. Uh, why did you choose Saudi Arabia? And uh, are you able to tell me about any new products that uh, will be created there? Yeah. The the thing is, uh, yeah, we, we have selected some 
uh, markets that we see that there is potential. And don't forget that in Saudi Arabia, there is a vision there, the 2030 vision. And on that basis, we thought that it would be good to make the first step. And uh, we will have announcements very soon, I promise you, within the next month or so, or two months on that respect. But there, uh, we are interested in Saudi Arabia, not just for the typical uh, uh, man portable, but we're we are quite interested in the vehicle uh, platforms that they have, also the aircraft platforms that they have, because they have plenty of them. And because we, as a group, we, we have other companies as well, like we have uh, an interoperability systems company, Skitalis. And as we start combining things, um, we thought that Saudi Arabia is a very good uh, uh, area where we can develop together some of those products that we have in mind and we have started developing. And um, uh, we know that's not going to be easy, but, uh, you know, we have to invest and we have to re also respect uh, the desires of other countries to, to create an industrial base. We have to respect them. They, they are our customers. Christian Hachimenez, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to another episode of the Weekly Defence Podcast. As always, a big thanks to everyone who took the time of being with us today. For our listeners, if you enjoyed the show, make sure you like and subscribe, leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Until next week, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.